Hi guys, welcome to The Homegrown Artist. My name is Barbara and this is part two of the Magellan Mission Gold uh, 36 set um, with the palette review. Um, so I forgot to mention in the last video that they also offer these same exact colors and a, a bigger 36 set with 15 milliliter tubes instead of the 7 milliliter tubes. So when you do run out of the 7 milliliter tubes to fill this up with, you can always purchase that, um, that larger set with the 15 mils and uh, refill this palette as you go. And they do also offer that set on Amazon for a huge discount. Um, so you could paint with these for a long, long while. Alright, so um, we're going to go ahead and get into some of the putting the paints to the test. So what, so what I've done is I've made this little sheet right here. We can test the colors. We're going to do some flow test. Um, and I did say in the previous video that I would show you some of the PY150s by themselves, the nickel azo yellow. We're going to show the two granulating colors. Um, we're going to do a few color wheels. Not actually in wheels, but we're going to do them in lines uh, just because that seems to be easier for me. And then we're going to try some mixes um, that you would normally get to create neutrals or blacks or anything like that. Um, and then we're going to try mixes with colors that have uh, two or more pigments in them and see if that muddies up the colors. Uh, and then these little squares are just so I can show you the darkest value because this will be kind of more spread out with water. And also at the very end of the video, I'm going to just color this little leaf that I've drawn out right here. Um, I'm not going to do anything big and fancy with these because I like to take my time painting with these and doing glazes and um, layers and stuff like that. So I figured I can show you that in a leaf, show you how well the paints glaze and how they work and everything. So I'm just going to show you this little sample here of a um, demonstration of me painting with the paints. Um, and that will be at the very end of the video whenever I'm done with this sheet right here. Alright, so I have my palette moved over to the side, and then I'm going to get my general mixing brush. I like to, I know I've said this in a lot of other videos, but I like to use this brush just because it already has no tip, so I don't mind um, using it for mixing uh, because it doesn't bother me if the tip gets messed up anymore. Um, so I'll be using this for this whole entire swatch section. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do, um, just while I have the paints out, is show you the... Um, it's called, it's PY150 is the pigment, and in Windsor Newton they call it transparent yellow, and then in Daniel Smith they call it nickel azo yellow. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and swatch those out, and that's the, um, the pigment that has questionable toxicity within um, the palette itself, uh, which I would actually not call it toxic. It's just, say if some people were, were allergic to peanuts, then you wouldn't call peanut butter toxic. You would just say, hey, people who are allergic to peanuts, stay away, right? So if you have a skin reaction to the nickel azo yellow, or to nickel in general, then just kind of stay away from this color would be my viewpoint on that. Um, but otherwise, I would call this palette very non-toxic. All right, so first we're going to get to Windsor and Newton. Um, and I just have a little bit squeezed out in this thing because I was testing some new ones are in Newton colors. Um, and that was one of them. Alright, so this is the Windsor and Newton transparent yellow. Uh, very, very pretty and very transparent. So they named it very well. Um, However, because it is so transparent, you can't get very dark hues, which is fine. Um, but that's the Windsor and Newton one. Let me actually zoom in a little bit so that y'all can see more of what I'm doing. So that's the Windsor and Newton version, and then the Daniel Smith version, Nickel Azo Yellow. It's actually one of my favorite colors because I do like bright and vivid colors, so... Um, I enjoy this color. Some people may be like, whoa, that's too bright and it's not natural. You can actually mix beautiful natural greens and uh, oranges and stuff with this color, but it is a very bright color and that's why a lot of the um, color swatches that I showed you that had this color in it were very bright and also very staining because this is a very staining um, pigment. 
Uh, so this is the Windsor and Newton version, and this is the Daniel Smith version. Uh, a little bit different. They are called different names. This one you can get more of a deeper um, yellow-orange tone than you can with that one. Um, but still very pretty colors in both ranges. Alright, so the next thing we're going to do while we're over on this side is just show a little bit of the granulation. Um, so Daniel's, I meant, so Mission Gold is not known for their granulating colors, uh, but they do have two that tend to granulate, and one of them is um, the Opera Rose. Uh, and you don't see the granulation in this one as much as you would in the um, Ultramarine, but it does, it does granulate. So I'm just going to spread that out a little bit. And the reason I'm doing this first, or going ahead and doing it before I do all the other stuff, is because it takes time to see the granulation. Sometimes you have to wait for it to dry a little bit. Uh, so, And then this is the Ultramarine, um, which actually you can kind of see the granulation already happening. And then when you mix them together, you get a beautiful granulating bright purple. Which, of course, is not going to be light fast, but it's still very pretty. Um, so we'll check out the granu granulation in those in just a little bit. <clears throat> Alright, so now for the actual official tests for the Mission Gold. Uh, is w The first one is Wet on Wet. Um, I'm going to make sure I have my paper pretty saturated with a good sheen on there. I don't want it too wet. I don't want blobs of water on the surface of the paper. And I want to give it time to kind of soak in. Uh, because if you put paint into really, really wet water on the surface of paper, it's not going to flow very well. So you do want to give it time to soak in a little bit. Um, so I'm actually going to compare... Uh, first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do um, a big swatch of, of a lot of color and see if that flows. Um, so it does have a little bit of flow, but not as much as some other brands. And then I'm going to water that down a little bit because I have noticed um, just from painting with the colors that the, um, the more pigment that you have on your brush, the less it flows. So if you can see here a little bit, it flows a little bit more than just the huge swatch there. Um, or it seems like it to me. Uh, and then time will also tell because it takes a little time for some paints to actually flow out. Just to give you a comparison to say like a, a paint that has more high flow, I'm going to do, um, let's see, Green Gold with Daniel Smith. And... Uh, yeah, that's extremely high flow compared to the Mission Gold. So they don't really have very high flow. They flow like a normal watercolor would, with, um, and they react the way a watercolor would. You just have to kind of train it where to go more than you would with this. And um, I guess another way for me to show you that would be with the pulling out with water. So I'm going to use the same brush load of the Green Gold that I have there. Maybe get a little bit more. So when you have a color that is high flow, all you have to do to tell it where to go is say I want like a little circled edge right here, is paint the water on there and then touch the paint. Um, and in general, the paint, especially if you let gravity kind of do its job, the paint's going to flow out to where you had painted it. Um, now, of course, I didn't do this perfect. I'm not painting an actual painting here, but I will show you the difference. Um, so with Mission Gold, um, it doesn't actually do that as well. So let's try to do that again, just a little circle here. And then whenever you touch the color, it should... <laughs> I'm actually trying to force it to do it and it's still not doing it. Um, so it doesn't really have that that high flow that a lot of like loose painters like. I, I generally tend to like paints that do this because you can take a full brush load of like really dark color and then kind of pull it out to where you want it to go and not have um, extremely dark colors in certain areas. You can fade the color out by pulling it out with water and the, the paint will tend to flow where the water is. Um, but as you can see over here, 
Um, now I did use, this is just one swatch of the green gold, and I did do two swatches with the, um, and with the Mission Gold. Uh, so, it does flow, it just takes a little bit more time. It doesn't, like, wick out as quickly as other paints, but it does flow. So if you have an area where you want to put paint, you just have to understand the fact that it may take a little bit more time for the paint to flow. Um, and it does, like they do claim, have even dispersion. So instead of um, wicking out all crazy, um, it does pretty much do a very good job of flowing out very evenly on the paper. So I think um, the reason they made it like that is so that you can have more control over the paint. All right, so now we're gonna get into some color wheels. Our color swatches. Uh, when I'm trying to paint color wheels, I always have a problem mixing the colors, I guess because it's in a circle shape. I have no idea, but this is much easier for me, so I'm going to stick to that. All right, so we're going to do lemon yellow. And then permanent rose. And this would be like your general... In the last video, I showed you the three main colors that you would probably need um, to mix pretty much anything out of it. So this would be like your digital color wheel or your actual color wheel, um, where you can get pretty much any color um, that you need out of it. Um, so that makes a beautiful orange. I'm going to add just a little bit more of that permanent rose because it tends to be drying up on this paper. This is just student grade paper. Um, I decided not to use my Arsh more expensive paper to do this. Uh, so the next color would be what they call cerulean, but it's actually thalo um, green. I meant thalo blue, green shade. Uh, and that is a lot of it. And it, when it's watered down, it kind of mimics what cyan would look like. So makes a beautiful purple with that rose color. And then the very last color I'll be adding is, again, to com complete kind of the circle, would be the lemon yellow again. Um, and they make, together, the cerulean and the lemon yellow make very bright and vivid greens. Uh, so that's just your average color wheel with your, um, your three primaries and your three secondaries. Um, and so now I'm going to go, this is kind of a split primary if you add these two together. Uh, because now I'm going to the more warm colors, so we're using Permanent Yellow Deep. If I can clean that off a little bit. Had be, I had cat hair on it. That's the trouble with having cats is they like to get hair all over your stuff. Alright, so Permanent Yellow Deep and then Permanent Red uh, would be my warm shade of red. This is also known as Naphthal Red and other brands. And as you can see, when you mix it with this yellow, you get a more bright and vivid orange. Now I'm going to add a little bit more of the permanent red because I let it dry on me a little bit. And then I don't have um, the original Ultramarine with just the PB29. So for up here, I'm just going to use Prussian Blue. Um, but then I'm going to add in... Or show you what it looks like with the ultramarine deep that is given in this palette because um, it's still it's kind of similar all right so this makes more of a neutral kind of muddy purple because um, this blue, although it's still a cool blue, is closer to the warm spectrum, and this red is close to the warm spectrum. So when you mix uh, a warm red with either a cool blue or a warm blue, you're going to get more of a muddy purple than this bright and vivid purple. Um, uh, but if you mix a cool um, blue, which is closer to purple on the color wheel, and a cool red, which is also closer to purple on the color wheel, then, then you'll get bright and vivid um, purples. And the same thing with the oranges. Um, if you can see how this one is more toned down uh, than this one right here, it's the same concept. Uh, the warm red is closer to orange on the color wheel and the warm yellow is closer to orange on the color wheel. So when you mix them together, you get a brighter orange. 
All right, so the next one is adding the permanent yellow deep to the Prussian blue. And here again, you'll get um, more of an earthy green than you would up top because you're mixing a warm yellow with a, um, I don't know, Prussian blue is kind of warm, but it's also kind of cool. So I would say it's kind of a neutrally blue in some cases. Here it looks kind of cool, but compared to phthalo blue or the cerulean in this palette, it looks more warm. Um, but you'll see it even more toned down when I mix the ultramarine deep with the uh, yellow and the red. Um, but like I said, you get more of a toned down green. Uh, so now I'm going to get the ultramarine deep. And that is actually wet in my palette because uh, I have tried to make this video before, so I'm kind of running out of the ultramarine. Oh, that was a lot of paint. I just got it really fast. All right, so this is the ultramarine. I'm gonna add enough down here to add to the red. I just kind of made a boo-boo there. That's all right. All right, so when I add the permanent red to it, it's gonna make an even darker toned um, purple. More of a muddy purple than even the Prussian blue. And you can, of course, the more blue you add, the darker it gets. I'm trying to add more blue and not go too far over on that side. So yeah, a more toned down, neutralized version of a purple there. And I'm going to add a little bit more of the ultramarine. And then the yellow deep, permanent yellow deep. And here you'll get, like I said, even more of a neutralized, toned down green than even with the Prussian um, blue. Um, kind of looks like moss green. Uh, so a good green for, uh, for landscapes and stuff like that. All right, so the last color wheel that I'm going to show you is more for, like, if you really like earth tones and you want to stick to, like, an earth tone palette, Say you paint a lot of rusty old barns or rusty old trucks or landscapes or anything like that, then this would be a good palette for you. Um, however, the yellow ochre in this palette, like I showed in the previous video, is made with two pigments, so it's not going to be, um, and it, it's more brighter because it does, more brighter, it's more bright because it does have the nickel azo yellow in it, so it's not going to be as toned down as some other um, neutral palettes, but it's still pretty toned down. Alright, so I'm gonna, my red that I'm going to use, usually I would use Burnt Sienna, but because it's made up with three pigments in here, I decided to use Red Brown instead, um, which is kind of what, it's close to Burnt Sienna. And some other brands. Alright, so you would get a I'm going to add a little bit more yellow over there. You get a more toned down version of orange here. Kind of looks like rust a little bit. Alright, so now I'm going to add the Prussian blue again. Again, because I don't have another single pigment um, dark color. Normally I would also use indigo for this to get a more toned down neutralized palette. Um, but... This indigo is not a very good indigo, so I feel like I don't want to use it for the neutralized palette. So if I were painting um, with a neutralized, more neutral palette, then I wouldn't use indigo from this palette. Alright, so you get not quite a purple, it's more of like a purpley brown, I guess. Uh, let's zoom in so you can see that a little bit better. Um, it has neutral, I mean, it has purple hues to it, but it's not as purple as the more bright and vivid purples up there, but it does give you a very neutral color to work with. Let's add a little bit more Prussian blue. And then some yellow ochre. And 
and this should give you a pretty um, earthy green. Not as earthy as this one up here. Um, maybe next time I should use the ultramarine. Because <laughs> uh, the Prussian blue is pretty cool and because a pretty cool version of a blue and because the um, yellow ochre does have the nickel azo yellow in it, it tends to be way more bright than um, what it would normally be. Just for funsies sake. Oh, y'all missed that on the camera. I'm sorry. Um, but as you can see, it's not as toned down as this one right here, but it is more neutralized than this one right here. Um, just for fun's sake, let's mix up some of the ultramarine right here with some of that yellow ochre and see what happens. I think because of the, um, yeah, because of the nickel azo yellow and the yellow ochre, it doesn't neutralize or tone down the greens as much as a more natural um, yellow ochre would do. Um, I mean, it still tones it down, but not as much. It still has gives it that bright hue to it. Um, like if I water this down, it would be still very pretty bright green. Uh, but anyway, you can still get a variety of ranges of color wheels there if you like to um, work on, with three colors at once or um, if you like to work with a split primary palette. Um, I would say definitely, like I said in the previous vi video, replace the ultramarine deep with the ultramarine so that you can use that in your split primary palette because um, Prussian blue is not really a very warm blue. So it doesn't work the same way. Uh, so if you want more, more of a neutralized um, secondary palette, the ultramarine blue would work much better than the Prussian blue. Because as you can see, you get more toned down purples and greens. All right, so now we're gonna try to mix some neutrals. I'm gonna keep it zoomed out so I don't accidentally get off camera again. Um, all right, so we are mixing ultramarine plus burnt sienna. Let's see what we get there. It's actually really hard to paint with these paints while the paint is still what paint with this these paints. <laughs> it's actually really hard to paint um, with Magello Mission Gold while the paints are still wet because you pick up so much paint at, at once and like I said my uh, ultramarine is relatively wet still. Alright so with burnt sienna let's see what happens there. Alright so we have the ultramarine and then we have burnt sienna and mix them together and what do we get? Um, kind of a, a gorgeous brown whenever they're mixed uh, with more burnt sienna in it. And then kind of like a very muted dark green when you put more ultramarine in it. Um, so not the Jane's gray or the very light um, neutral gray that we are used to getting. And then I'm going to try to get like the darkest version that I could possibly get. Mixing those two colors together. Uh, still doesn't give me, still gives me a very greenish brown. Um, all right, so then we are going to go to the, uh, I can zoom in a little bit more. Hope everyone can see that. Uh, so next we're going to try actually ultramarine and burnt umber. See what that gives us. Uh, so again, some ultramarine. And then the burnt umber. And I'm trying to keep it um, not very watery, so more like a thick consistency. 
because uh, that's how you would create the more darker um, neutral tones. Um, so I feel like by the time you get it, and I'll show you that color kind of watered down. You do get a neutral tone, but it's not exactly what you would get whenever you mix uh, the original Burnt Umber that's just made out of PBR7 with the Ultramarine, which of course I don't have the original Ultramarine either. So maybe if I had um, Ultramarine that was single pigmented, it wouldn't be um, like that. Um, and then let's see the darkest value that I can get there. I'm sure you can probably still get a black with this. Um, just whenever you want to use a lighter version of the black, it's probably not going to stay gray. It's more of a brownish hue than a gray hue. So you can get it dark enough to be kind of black, um, but when you water it down it's more, like I said, more of a brownish hue. Um, so when trying to mix neutrals that kind of becomes a problem and even this one right here when it dried it's more, it's got more of like a golden undertone um, than a neutralized brown. It actually kind of looks like a golden orangey green. It's not an ugly color. It's a very pretty color, actually, and the granulation kind of makes it beautiful, I think. Um, but it's not what you would expect to get out of those colors. Um, and this one right here is kind of turning a little purpley. Um, I don't know if y'all can see that on camera, but you can still get kind of the darker neutral colors if you need them in a pinch. All right, so I figured we'd try Ultramarine and Van Dyke Brown because Van Dyke Brown is the um, single pigment PBR7, so I thought, hey... Let's give that a shot and see what we get there. Alright, so Ultramarine. And then Van Dyke Brown. See, this is what I, more of what I'm used to a burnt umber looking like. This is Van Dyke Brown. Um, so you do get a rather grayish neutral there, so that's good. Good to know. It does still have kind of that purpley undertone. Um, and I think that's just because of the PB15 within the Ultramarine. But you can still get kind of like a black... Let's see if when you fade it out, what it turns into. So yeah, still pretty gray and neutral. So I would say that that actually gives you um, kind of similar to a Jane's gray, so close to that. Apparently I made a mess somewhere on this paper somehow. All right, so a version of black that I know for sure that you can get with this... Um, with this palette would be Viridian and Rose Matter. Um, they make it makes very dark blacks. Uh, you just have to use more paint than water. All right, so that would be the Viridian or the Thalo Green Blue shade, and then Rose Matter. I always get lost on my palette. <laughs> it's a lot of colors to remember exactly where each one is. Alright, so then Rose Matter, and as you can see, I'm not using the color very watered down, because if you want to get black, then you need um, pretty thick pigments. Uh, you get a beautiful kind of like purpley color on this end, and then you do get to a black, kind of like right here. Uh, so that looks very black. Um, now watered down, it would probably look more greenish or red, depending on which side of the spectrum it is because it does look very dark and neutral all the way through. Um, so depending on how much red and how much um, green you've added, let's see if I can mix it up in the palette. Yeah. Then it may not be very very neutral. Um, kind of have to work at it to get it extremely neutral. 
Um, but that makes a very beautiful black. So instead of using the ivory black, um, which is very flat, uh, this one would give you a very dark black that because it is made out of two um, pigments that you mix together, it would, would have a more vibrancy and then um, the colors kind of separate when it dries. So you can kind of see both the green and the red popping out, which um, I tend to like, uh, even though uh, it still looks black or it still looks very neutralized. So. This is another mix that I thought would make a very um, dark neutral. Um, Peacock Blue has two colors in it and Burnt Sienna has three colors in it. Uh, however, uh, Peacock Blue, because it's a very like greeny blue, um, and Burnt Sienna because it's a very reddish um, brown, I figured, figured mixing them together it would make a very very dark color. But I also think that because the Burnt Sienna has that Nickel Azo Yellow in it, again it's going to be a very dark color but when you pull it out which I'll do next to the side that it's going to be um, more of a green color but as it's more condensed with more pigment that it, it, it will be very dark so let's see what happens there and I also wanted to use um, with both of these right here both of these mixes I wanted to use pick uh, colors that have multiple pigments in them just to see if um, using that many pigments and mixing them if that kind of makes the colors muddy because that's why a lot of artists tend to like single pigment colors because it's a lot harder to get mud with single pigment colors but we'll see um, with Mission Gold if you get a lot of mud. Alright, so Peacock Blue that would be this one right here. Um, very beautiful blue, I love it. And then Burnt Sienna. Let's see what that gives us. Let me get a little bit more water there. So yeah, it gives us a very dark, dark color, but it does tend to be very green. So let's see if I add a little bit more peacock blue here, if that will darken up a little bit more. So yes, it is it does give you a very dark color, but whenever you pull it out, um, this has a lot of blue in it. When you pull it out, it is very green. And then if I were to get closer to in the middle, um, it makes more of a brighter green. Uh, I will zoom in on that so y'all can see what I'm talking about. So the more burnt sienna it has in it, it makes a very bright green. And then even the very dark where, where it looks black here, um, when you pull that out, it's a very bright and vivid green when it's watered down. Um, so still, um, the fact that it's bright and vivid and you still get this very bright and vivid green here, um, it doesn't seem like even though there's multiple, that's mixing five pigments, it doesn't seem very muddy. So that's a good thing. All right, so the next one and last one before the painting demonstration would be uh, mixing greenish yellow and burnt sienna. Both of them are made out of three different pigments. Uh, so I just wanted to kind of test it for myself as well. Um, so let's get some greenish yellow, which is one of my favorite greens. It's very pretty. Uh, and this is more to test whether or not you get mud more than to see if you get a dark color. I know it's probably going to make a neutral because it's green with a um, reddish brown. So probably get like a very bright orange, neutrally orange maybe. So let's see. Yeah, kind of like an earthy... So if you add just a little bit of the greenish yellow to the burnt sienna, it kind of tones it down, makes it more earthy than it is naturally. And then the more greenish yellow you add to add to it, the more kind of like a toned down um, muted green you get. But they still are bright and vivid, and um, I, I don't see it turn into mud, so... Um, that's a good thing, especially considering that they do have a lot of um, multiple pigment colors in here. 
That doesn't look very muddy to me. Let's zoom in on that so you can see that as well. Um, it actually, oh, I just touched it. I'm sorry. It actually looks very beautiful, I think. Very pretty color. Uh, not muddy at all. And that's using six pigments. So, all right. So the next thing we're going to get to is painting the um, leaf example. So I did clean my palette out um, from all those kind of crazy mixes and dark mixes that I had um, for showing you this earlier. Uh, so now it's a clean palette for me to start out with, although it is stained, like I did say in the first video, the palette does stain. Um, that's alright with me. So I think, I'm going to zoom in for y'all. Um, so I think for the initial wash, I'm going to use a very watered down version of the um, greenish yellow and see what happens there. It's a very bright yellow, so I'm hoping it would be very good in the highlights. So I'm just going to do an overall wash of this color. That's a good color. Make sure that's on camera. Yeah. So right now, of course, it's going to look nothing like the leaf in the picture because I don't have dark tones added. And uh, I'm using the highlight color as just an overall wash. I just used a baby wipe to clean the palette, and I don't know if it's the brand of baby wipes that I use, it's Pampers, uh, but for some reason, um, it did not, it doesn't smell good, mixed with the, um, with the watercolor palette. <laughs> Alright, so I'm going to switch over to the number one brush, and this little stem here, um, if you can tell in the picture, I don't know if you can, um, but it's kind of like a, a burnt sienna slash burnt umbery color. So it starts out kind of more orangey burnt sienna here and then goes out a little darker there. So I'm going to go ahead and do a very light version of the burnt sienna and then darken it down later if I need to. And I'm going to go ahead while I'm mixing and get some of the burnt umber. Um, again, very light wash of it. And I'm going to throw my brush everywhere. Alright, so I'm not too worried about the burnt sienna um, bleeding into this, although it is almost dry already. But I'm not too worried about the burnt sienna bleeding into this right here, um, just because this is a darker toned version of the leaf. So if it does bleed in, it's not going to be a problem. All right, so I have the, I'm actually going to add the burnt sienna in a little bit because it neutralizes that green. Um, and then I can add the burnt umber. And it's okay if it bleeds in a little bit. So I may need to go in with um, a darker brown, maybe uh, more Van Dyke brown and then some sepia because it, it gets, um, it's very light up here. And then it gets more of the burnt sienna hue and then burnt umber and then more of a Van Dyke brown kind of hue there. I hope you can see what I'm talking about there. Um, but for now, I'm going to go in and dry all this. Um, normally, I let my paintings dry on their own because, I, like I said, I can paint like in like 10 and 15 minute intervals. Uh, but um, just for the purpose of this video, I'm going to go ahead and heat, dry it with a heat tool. And this is the Ranger Heated Craft Tool, which I use when I'm crafting or doing mixed media or anything like that. But it works very, very great with watercolor as well. And it's very quiet. You can hear me talking um, through it, which is awesome. So I love that tool. All right. So... Now we're going to look at 
Um, so I already kind of penciled in the highlights here. So I know that this is kind of a highlight and then these colors up here are highlighted. Um, it's got a few highlights right here I did not pencil in and then some highlights right there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and do the darkest tones first. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and zoom back out just a little bit so you all can see the picture, the reference and the photo. Or the reference in the painting. Um, so yeah, I'm going to do the darkest tones first. I think the color that I'm going to use, um, I'm going to use what the palette has given me and I, th hmm, I think the hooker's green or maybe the olive green would be the best option there. Yeah, olive green seems good. And I may not go the darkest value yet. Uh, but I do know that down here, um, it's relatively dark. It's got like a dark kind of patch here. And I already know, just looking at the colors, that I am going to have to go in again and um, darken the value. Um, And then there's some more dark value right here. So basically I'm just mapping out where my dark values would be in the painting. And I don't normally paint like this, so it's not going to be perfect. Um, normally I'm more of a loose let the watercolor do its thing kind of painter. Uh, so, no harsh judgments, please. Um, this is relatively dark. And then kind of goes back out here. I may have to mix in some of that Van Dyke brown and see what happens there. See, and even this leaf, whenever you're doing glazes in tiny little sections, it's going to take probably an hour for me to paint this leaf. Um, let's see, some more darker areas. A lot of the veins um, going into the leaf are very dark. Actually, going to go ahead and just go ahead and paint those veins in. There's a few little short ones right here. I hope I'm not like showing you my head in the video. And to mix a little bit more of that color up. Um, probably for the rest of this painting session, um, I'm going to go ahead and speed it up until I get to something that I need to talk to you about or explain what I'm doing or anything like that. Uh, but other than that, I think I'm just going to speed it up. Alright, so all I'm doing now is continuing, 
continuing to add the vein, the darker colors for the veins here. Um, trying to add them in the direction that they look like on the leaf. Um, and then I'm drying it with the heat tool and then going in with a darker um, glaze just to give kind of the highlights, um, more of the highlights on the leaf for whenever I do go in with the even darker tones. And so now I'm adding, I think this is some of the Van Dyke green mixed in with the sap green uh, to get my darkest values. And so again, just adding those on the veins because those tend to be uh, some of the darkest values in the leaf. Uh, another way you could do this if you're more into the style of loose painting is paint your layers on there and then use a credit card scraper. Um, if you've seen any of Lindsay, the, fr the frugal crafter, any of her videos, she loves using this credit card scraper. Um, it's a good way to get um, leaves that look like leaves but not having to actually paint them in, paint the veins in. So now I'm painting in some more lighter veins. I'm trying to get it as realistic as I can. Uh, painting a little shadow on the line just to let myself know that right below that shadow is a little highlight in the leaf. Uh, you can see where I kind of left that highlight there. So now I am glazing over with um, some more of that sap green with a little bit of Prussian blue added into it um, to get the tone closer to the reference or the hue closer to the reference color. And now I'm just adding more shadows and glazing over some of those highlights because since I added the darker blue, the highlights were a little bit too dark. Um, now I'm adding burnt sienna, uh, burnt umber, and Van Dyke brown to the stem, making sure I leave that little highlight part at the top closer to the leaf. Uh, now I'm going back in and adding just a few more shadows uh, in the darkest areas, like right underneath where the leaf turns a little bit, um, kind of to accentuate that turn. And I think that's about it. All right, everyone. So here's the leaf that I drew from this reference right here. And like I said, uh, I'm still kind of learning to paint in that more tight, more very detailed style. Um, so it's not perfect, but I mean, it shows how the colors glaze very well and kind of demonstrates how you can use the Magello Mission Gold paints. Um, now I did try to paint a loose kind of rose here. Um, had a little problems there because the color doesn't flow as well as um, as like Daniel Smith colors do, or even the Windsor and Newton colors. Uh, so the colors just didn't flow out as well. I mean, it still kind of looks like a rose, a very loose. If someone were to come and see this, they would know that I was trying to paint some kind of flower, some kind of rose or carnation or something like that. I'm not really good with the names of flowers, but they would know, hey, that's a, a flower. Um, but because the paint does not flow as well, like I've showed you on other demonstrations, and this is artist watercolor paper, so I'll show you that here. Um, just if I am trying to spread the color out, it doesn't really go anywhere, so you kind of have to force it to go places, and that kind of uh, makes you create more bl more blooms and stuff in your painting. Um, but this is like a five minute, maybe five minute, like little sketch that I was doing after I recorded, just to kind of test it out. And then also when I'm doing loose roses, I I generally tend to go in and I would paint our lift color out, um, and as you can see. I'll even use a bigger brush that's more juicy and wet. Um, the colors don't seem to want to lift out as much, which because most of these colors, like I said in the first video, are very, very staining. Uh, so I think the main purpose would be um, if you know exactly what you're trying to paint. Uh, so for more detailed stuff like this, um, they're not very good at lifting up highlights. Uh, so the loose paintings, you can still get the, get them done. It would just take practice and getting used to how the paints work. Um, 
So yeah, I just wanna, wanted to kind of show you this. I don't have it recorded on camera or anything like that, but um, I just wanted to show you that you can get some loose paintings done. It's just going to take some practice. It's even going to take me pr practice, and I've had these paints for a year now, but I've been, um, I started off painting more loose style, and so now I'm trying to get into the more detailed style, and as you can tell, I'm not quite there yet, uh, <laughs> but I'm getting there. Um, but... I just kind of wanted to give a demonstration and show you that these are great paints. They do glaze and layer very well. didn't have any problems with the colors lifting up or anything like that. Uh, especially, like I said, they're very staining colors. And so um, they don't tend to want to lift up even whenever they're wet. So uh, once you dry these and you add uh, additional glazes and stuff, the the colors underneath are not going to lift up and muddy up anything you've already done. So like I did these lines first and then I did um, glazes over that and these lines didn't lift up at all. Uh, so that's a good thing when you are into detail painting. So if you're a botanical painter or um, you just like painting in a lot of glazes and you like really tight, your painting style is really tight rather than loose like this, then uh, these are, would be some great paints for you. Uh, so I just wanted to go over that. I hope that everything that I went through um, demonstrating the mixes and just the way that the color flows and even the crazy loose, not very pretty rose right here and the leaf, um, the painting demonstration, I hope all of that went in to help you decide whether or not these paints were for you or whether you would decide to pick a different paint. Um, I, hope, I just hope it was helpful in general. Uh, so if it was, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. And if you have any questions or comments or want to add something, um, please just leave that in the comment section down below. And I will see you in the next video. I hope you have a great day. Bye!